Welcome to Relation Tales. Please like this video and subscribe Relation Tales. I looked around the restaurant to find the person I was supposed to meet. Then, I saw my ex-wife Susan with a man who looked a bit overweight and older. He seemed like he used to be fit, but now he looked different because of eating too much and getting older. Susan looked happy sitting next to him. He seemed rich from the way he looked and acted. Memories of our past rushed back to me as I stood there. Even though it had been three years since we got divorced, the feelings were still strong. I ended up watching them from a distance instead of being with them. Later, things got worse for me when I went to Albany for a meeting with a client. I planned to stay overnight to avoid a long drive back, but my plans changed when the client called just an hour into the trip to say there was a small accident with the car, although he was okay. Apologizing for the late cancellation, he expressed his regret, to which I assured him it was no inconvenience, suggesting we reschedule. Nevertheless, I felt unprepared for the extra two hours of driving ahead. Promising to do my best, I planned to return home for a surprise romantic dinner with my beloved wife. Ninety minutes later, I finally turned onto my street. The first thing that caught my eye was the presence of three unfamiliar cars parked in the driveway. Knowing my wife often invited her friends over when I was away, I didn't think much of it. I parked on the street and entered the house, assuming everything was normal. However, the sight of four sets of clothes strewn across the living room floor immediately signaled that something was amiss. As I stood there, a gut-wrenching realization hit me. My wife's passionate cry wasn't a call for help. It was a familiar plea for more intense lovemaking. My heart sank as I grasped the truth. My wife was engaged in an carnal encounter with someone else. Despite my reluctance, I knew I had to face the reality awaiting me upstairs. I was met with the sound of my wife emitting a primal scream. Stealthily peering around the bedroom doorframe, I beheld three men. While unfamiliar with two of them, the third was unmistakably her boss from work, Jeff Davis. To my shock, they had my wife engaged in carnal acts. My disdain for Jeff deepened as he showered her with praise, acknowledging her assistance with his business clients. It made me feel sick to realize that this person was using my wife for his own benefit at work. All three of them treated her like she was just there for their pleasure, saying mean things and acting like they were in charge. Seeing her behave so differently from the woman I knew when we were married for 10 years, I couldn't help but agree with Jeff's mean words about her. I quietly left and went downstairs to my office without anyone noticing. I grabbed my digital video camera, which still had some battery left. I put an old cassette inside and set it up to record. Not to make a scandal, but to have proof for legal reasons. I placed the camera by the bedroom door and recorded my wife and the others involved. I could only handle about 10 minutes of it before my feelings overwhelmed me. Some people might find such a scene exciting, but for me, it only made me sad and feel deeply betrayed. Feeling very low, I went downstairs to gather my thoughts. In my office, I took my weapon from the safe and made sure it was ready just in case. I wasn't usually violent, but I felt the need to protect myself if things got worse. I went into the living room and took the car keys and wallets from the pants on the floor. Then I let the air out of all the tires of the cars parked outside, including Sue's car. Back inside, I smiled wickedly as I came up with a plan, thinking it would work if Sue had her phone with her. I got my camera ready, hid behind the stairs, and called her. After a few tries, she answered, and I could tell from the quiet in the background that she had told the others to stay quiet. Sue asked, Hey Bobby, how's Albany? I could hear the men laughing softly in the room. I pretended to be worried and asked if she was okay because she sounded out of breath. Yes, had to hurry upstairs for my phone call, she replied swiftly, composing herself. My client canceled, so I'll be home shortly. Interested in dinner? I asked calmly, though internally I felt more agitated than ever. Heading home now? She asked anxiously. Sounds good. Just need to get ready, babe. See you, she hurriedly replied before ending the call abruptly, leaving me with a knowing smile, aware of what was about to unfold in just a minute. As anticipated, four completely undressed individuals began descending the stairs into the living room. The men got dressed quickly, and Sue hurried to tidy herself too. They all left in a hurry, and Sue put on her shoes and jacket, hoping they would leave before she did. If she hadn't been so excited, she might have seen my car parked on the street. The men started shouting at her all at once, so Sue went onto the porch to listen. Just then, I closed and locked the front door behind her. My wife saw my face as I shut the door, and she tried to talk to me through the side window with a pleading voice, but it was too late for talking. The other men came back to my porch, banging on the front door, wanting their things. When I realized what they were up to, I called emergency services reporting an attempted break-in. The dispatcher informed me a neighbor had already called. 
Providing my name and address, I awaited police assistance, which arrived promptly just two minutes later. After the police interrogated my wife, I approached the two officers at the scene and informed them that my wife had been maltreated by the men present, demanding their arrest. This caused immediate reactions from the men, who began shouting that they were invited, and she consented, denying any maltreatment allegations. Everyone, including myself, turned to Sue, waiting for her response. She avoided eye contact and admitted in a subdued voice filled with shame that she had invited the men into the house, engaged in closeness activity with them, and wasn't maltreatmented. She acted of her own volition. The men seemed relieved to avoid maltreatment charges. Shortly after, two more police cars arrived, and they recorded everyone's names for their report. The senior officer then addressed me, suggesting that since my wife invited these men, and they were all over 18 years old, there was little legal recourse. He recommended counseling or similar assistance, delivering the remark with disdainful glare towards my wife. I instructed the police to call a taxi and inform them that Mrs. Thomas would not be allowed back into the house. That evening, one of the men called a taxi after discovering their flat tires. They also attempted to accuse me of stealing their belongings, but I refuted their claims to the police. Turning, I walked back to the porch, where Sue remained with them until the taxi arrived. I stood on the porch, my eyes flashing with anger. Despite my fury, my wife bravely approached me, unaware of my rage and the firearm on my person. She may have fled, had she known. She attempted to speak, but I swiftly interrupted. You've shattered my heart, and I'll never forgive you. Jeff called you a strumpet, and honestly, I think it's fitting. Henceforth, I'll refer to you as such and won't use your real name again. If you ever need to communicate with me, do so through Tad. With those final words, I retreated into the house, locking the door behind me, leaving her standing there. She hurried back to the group in tears and Jeff moved to console her. She rebuffed his embrace, which oddly brought me some solace. However, my fleeting satisfaction soon waned. Upon returning to my bedroom, the scent of lovemaking pervaded the air, further incensing me. I got really mad and started searching through the whole room, making a big mess. I grabbed the mattress and threw it out onto the front lawn. Then, I went to the garage and got my toolbox. I took apart the bed and threw its pieces outside with the mattress. Back in the bedroom, I picked up Sue's phone from the floor and looked at her contacts and messages. As I expected, I found some really gross emails, photos, and videos of her with other men. Looking at the pictures, I could see she knew these guys. I laughed bitterly, realizing I used to be really nice to her, but things had changed. I took all the boxes from our bedroom downstairs and put their stuff in piles on the front lawn. Then, I started getting rid of her things from the guest room. But when I tried to move the last drawer of the dresser outside, it wouldn't budge easily. Fueled by anger, I forcefully yanked it, hearing a telltale crack. With a bit of force, the drawer finally opened, revealing the source of the obstruction. Seven or eight DVDs hidden beneath. I accidentally cracked one of the plastic cases, but fortunately, the drive remained intact. My heart sank once more as I examined the discs. I didn't think I could feel any worse, yet I did. Descending the stairs, I scrutinized the titles on the discs, which only intensified my distress. Arriving in the living room, I arranged everything on shelves for closer inspection. The first disc depicted Sue with her close friend Sarah at Sarah's residence. Sue often assisted at Sarah's gatherings in Avon, typically held on Tuesdays and Thursdays. It looked like they were being close with different people at her house. As I watched the videos for hours, I started to cry, only stopping when I saw the last two discs. The first one showed Sue with her tennis instructor, someone I paid for her lessons. She went to these lessons every Saturday and came back too tired for intimacy later, which I now understood. The second disc showed Sue being close with people at her workplace, especially in the boardroom with Jeff, her boss, and Jeff's boss, Bill Evans. Bill was important in the community and often talked about in newspapers for his charity work. Now I saw that this extended to my wife's private life. I got a big envelope and carefully put her phone, the discs, and a tape I had made inside. I wanted to give the whole envelope to my lawyer and friend, Ted Worth, who I trusted a lot. He was one of only two individuals in whom I truly confided. Nothing else mattered at that moment. Glancing at Sue's computer on the desk, I powered it up and began duplicating every file, email, photo, and video onto external drives. It took approximately an hour to complete the process, after which I settled down to sift through my wife's digital archives. Among the videos were scenes reminiscent of those found on the CDS I had discovered. Additionally, I stumbled upon explicit images typically associated with adult websites. Delving further, I uncovered a trove of emails spanning about six months. Despite her attempts to conceal them under misleading file names, 
I unearthed correspondence between her, Jeff, and several other men, as well as exchanges with Sarah. Just last week I had dismissed them until one nearly devastated me. The thought of using my weapon crossed my mind, but I realized she wasn't worth it. I had to be tough. The email that really got to me was one from Sue to Sarah. Sarah was asking why Sue hadn't left me to be single again and wanted to know what Sue's dream husband would be like. Here's what Sue said. Sarah, I'm not interested in him anymore. Bobby is faithful, but not very smart. I'm worried he'll find out about my secret life soon. He's not completely clueless, but love makes him blind. Lately, he's been gaining weight, and his big belly is not attractive to me. Compared to other men, he's not as good. I also detest beards and mustaches, which make him appear somewhat repulsive. I once loved him deeply, but the excitement of recent years is too enticing to give up. His lawyer best friend could pose problems if he gets involved. Jeff and Bill at work hint at promotions and perks with suggestive undertones. I laugh. I also desire a house and a car. If I play my cards right, I could also secure alimony each month. Additionally, I'm anticipating our Tuesday party pending recovery from my tennis injury. Tony is impressive. Ensure I receive last Thursday's video. It was my first time with so many men simultaneously. As for my dream man, he must be affluent, loyal, compliant, and not too bright. He must cater to my every whim and still ask which one. I chuckle. I'm indifferent about the bedroom as long as there's money involved. I laugh. I can fulfill my needs elsewhere. Sometimes it feels too easy. Damn, Bobby's home now. Gotta go. I kept reading the letter over and over again. Its words made me feel sick, and the past few years hurt me deeply. Did she really think these things about me? Was I so blinded by love that she cheated on me for over two years? I went to bed and ended up falling asleep on the sofa. The next morning, I felt restless from not sleeping well, so I called in sick to work. I called my good friend and lawyer, Ted Worth, for help. Mary, Ted's secretary, answered the phone. I've known her almost as long as I've known Ted. I urgently requested a meeting, but she informed me he'd be tied up in court all day. Mary informed Ted that I need to meet him in his office in an hour. If he starts bothering you with nonsense, bring up Tammy Brown's name. That'll grab his attention. See you in an hour, I said before ending the call promptly. I began getting dressed when my phone rang. Reluctant to speak with Sue, I checked the caller ID. It was an unknown number, so I answered, suspecting it might be Ted returning my call. Hello, Mr. Thomas. This is Bill Evans from Susan's office. If possible, I'd like to discuss the events from last evening at your house. Could we meet today in my office to clarify the situation for all involved? Unsure if he was aware of the video footage of him with my wife at his workplace, I knew he was concerned about retaining Jeff Davis' key clients. My wife and Jeff were valuable assets to him, and he likely didn't want to lose them. Additionally, he was surely worried about negative publicity for his company and himself personally. Mr. Evans, I have an important meeting this morning, but I'll call you back on this number before noon to arrange something for today. I assured him calmly. I conveyed it as though he was reasoning with me. He was in for a surprise. As I stepped out, I glimpsed what resembled a bizarre yard sale. The broken bed and Sue's clothes were still strewn about. An elderly neighbor waved, wearing a curious expression. I knew I'd become the talk of the neighborhood. As they say in the news, it was a suburb sensation. In the city center, I grabbed a bite to eat before heading straight to Ted's office. Mary brewed a cup of coffee for me, lots of cream, no sugar. We had a long history together. Holy crap, Bobby. I don't know what you've got on Tad, but I mentioned his name, and he instructed me to clear his schedule for today. I could use a month off, she quipped. If you want to know who Tammy Brown is, she added jokingly, you'll have to ask Ted. By the way, where is he? I inquired. He said he'd be here right away. He needed to reschedule his meeting with the judge for today's court hearing, she informed me. Just then he walked in. Holy crap, Bobby Tammy Brown. You must be in big trouble for mentioning that name to me. Come into the office and let's talk. Mary, don't connect me to anyone right now, Tad said quickly. I grabbed my coffee, and he closed the door for privacy. I told him about what happened the night before and what I found out about Sue's new life. Then, I gave him an envelope with all the evidence I collected, and finally he started talking. He listened carefully to everything I said without interrupting. I could see him thinking about the legal side of things as he processed what happened. I also told him about Bill Evans wanting to meet today. Well, Bobby, let's focus on what's important, he said. I've known you for a long time, and I know you're really upset. Do you think there's any chance you and Sue can make things right, he asked. Ted, if it were Katie, your wife, and you found those videos and emails, you'd leave her right away. 
I want a divorce, but I also want to make her pay for what she did. I'm not going to just let this betrayal slide, I told him. Okay, first we'll sue Tony and the tennis club. Sarah is just a friend, so we won't go after her. But Sue's workplace is a different story. We'll sue the two clients and their companies who were at your house. We'll also go after Jeff Davis, Bill Evans, and their friends, Ted said. He warned me that things might get worse before they get better. But I don't care. Even if I have to resort to physical confrontation, I'm going to make these people pay for what they've done through Sue. I asserted with anger in my voice. All right, Bobby, recap what Bill Evans wanted, and we'll proceed from there. Ted informed me that we explored several options, and I favored the final one. A direct attack on Sue's workplace seemed most fitting. I had leverage with video evidence of Davis, Evans, and Sue in their boardroom, Ted explained, noting that as Sue's superiors, they influenced her position. It could also result in serious legal repercussions. I liked the sound of it. Ted also hinted that once Bill Evans realized what evidence we had, his stance would change, likely resulting in a settlement offer. If it's less than two million, he can forget it. I remarked firmly, I'll tell you what, Ted, make it two. Five million. I've seen your legal bills before. I joked. Come over tonight at 7 p.m. Katie will whip up a fantastic dinner for us. You could use a break from home, I insisted. I quickly set up a meeting with Bill Evans for 2 p.m. Then Mary looked into the office. Ted, they're calling you online. It's Susan, she said. Ted got annoyed. Mary, I said no calls, he snapped. Sorry, Ted, but she wants to talk to you, Mary persisted. Does she know Bobby is here, Ted asked. I don't think so, Mary replied. Tell her I'll talk to her in a minute, Ted said calmly as Mary left. She probably found out her phone, computer, and DVDs are missing. I bet she's mad that I put all her stuff on the front lawn along with our bed, I told him. You had a busy evening. Let me handle this conversation, and please don't interrupt. As your lawyer, I need to explain some things, he said, connecting the call. I started to overhear a one-sided conversation, but I could almost discern what she was saying to Tad without hearing her words. Hi, Susan, this is Ted. Yes, I already spoke to him. Bobby is a stand-up guy and my friend. I thought you of all people would have his back instead of betraying him. No excuses, Sue. I'm not in the mood. Yes, I'll represent him. He has strong arguments. You know this won't be pleasant, right? I'll talk to him. But you've shattered a man who has always faithful and deeply loved you. I doubt he cares about your opinion. My advice is to get yourself a good lawyer. You'll need one. Yes, Bill Evans scheduled an appointment for 2 p.m. Though I don't think you should attend. Listen to me, Sue. If you even attempt to eavesdrop outside the office door, I'll advise Bobby to leave and things will escalate. It's better to wait and keep yourself composed today. I know he put your belongings out on the lawn, but just as you can invite strangers into your bedroom, he can remove your possessions from the house. Frankly, I'm surprised he didn't resort to violence last night. Yes, he was armed, but for self-defense purposes. Remember he believed you were in danger of assault. It's in the police report. I can't say for certain. But if it were my Katie, I'd likely be in custody right now. I think he acted out of anger given the circumstances. You'll need to speak to the co-owner of the house. Perhaps he left them on the lawn along with your clothes and someone took them. I've done all the paperwork for the house, and both of you have the same rights, Ted said. He told Sue firmly to stay where she was and let Bobby stay in the house until things were sorted out because it wasn't safe for her to be there with him right now. He warned Sue not to push it and said he felt like punching her in the nose. He told her to stay with Sarah and promised to keep in touch, asking her lawyer to call him once they got one. Ted said her tears wouldn't change his mind because he was not only Bobby's lawyer, but also his friend. He said her tears wouldn't make him change his mind, and that he could be very tough when he needed to be, which was one of those times. He said he was sorry she had to see a side of him that only his enemies see and warned her that she wouldn't like it. Ted told Sue to stay away from Bobby and stay in her office for now because he didn't want anything to do with her. Glancing up at me, Ted asked if I caught most of that conversation, his tone tinged with sadness. I confessed to my friend that I did catch most of it, expressing my wish to confront her face to face and express my true feelings. However, I admitted that I didn't think I could bear the pain of seeing her again, at least not yet. I have a couple of requests for you, Bobby, he said, his demeanor shifting instantly to one of positivity and optimism. First, hand me those tapes. Ted indicated for me to retrieve the videotapes from the envelope. Those from the previous night, the ones featuring Tony at the tennis club, and the footage of Sue with Mr. Davis and Mr. Evans in her office. After handing him the tapes, he instructed me to invite Mary to join me for lunch. I gave him a puzzled look. 
to which he promptly responded in kind. I think it's best if I review them myself to spare you any further distress before our meeting at 2 p.m. Moreover, I don't believe watching this material would benefit you right now. I don't want you to be upset before our meeting with Bill Evans. I acknowledged his wisdom and thanked him before sharing the good news with Mary. She jokingly suggested I take her to an upscale restaurant if Ted was footing the bill. We both chuckled and left the premises. Mary proved to be an excellent dining companion, and for the next hour she helped me forget my troubles. Upon our return, we heard Ted cheering as we entered the office. He was in high spirits, doing a little victory dance at his desk. These recordings are a game changer, Bobby. I can't believe it, he exclaimed. My expression turned bittersweet, and I think he finally grasped why. Oh, Bobby, I'm truly sorry I didn't acknowledge the significance of these videos. I know Sue's actions have deeply hurt you. I was just excited about what I uncovered. He apologized sincerely. Bobby, come over here. I need your eyes on something. Ted beckoned me. And I complied, positioning myself behind him to view his screen. Did you watch the entire video Tony shot at the tennis club with Sue? He inquired. No, I only managed to skim through some of it last night. It was tough to stomach without feeling the urge to lash out or worse. I admitted honestly. Well, brace yourself. Towards the end, just after Tony and Sue finish, they attract a small crowd in the men's locker room. Yes, the tennis club's locker room. I hate to say it, but she let the other men who were watching join in after Tony. I'm not saying this to make you upset, but to show you this man, Ted said, pointing at the screen on his desk. The man in the video was older and had a towel around him. He had long gray hair and a big mustache. Ted asked if I knew who he was. He pressed play and I saw the man drop the towel, showing off something any man would be proud of. The problem was, he went right to my wife and had sex with her. Then, five more men came around, waiting for their turn, I said. I don't know who this guy is, but I guess you do, I replied, trying to stay calm. Bobby, this is something we can use for our meeting today at the tennis club, Ted said, excitedly explaining his plan. I smiled when I heard what he had in mind. Ted was not only my friend, but also a great lawyer. I was relieved to have him on my side this time. We departed his office for downtown, armed with a portable DVD player, some printed photographs, and legal envelopes. Upon arrival at Sue's building, we proceeded to Bill Evans' office on the top floor, with Sue's office located one floor below. After waiting in the reception area, we were eventually ushered into Mr. Evans' lavishly furnished office. Just before entering, I sent someone observing me from the hallway. I glanced in that direction and caught a glimpse of the woman before she vanished around the corner. Relieved I wouldn't have to confront her today, we stepped into Bill's office adorned with opulent furniture and adorned with plaques, awards, and photos of him with various notable figures. The thought crossed my mind. Had he ever brought Sue here? At that moment, my disdain for Mr. Evans intensified more than ever. I introduced Ted and took the lead in the conversation. Hello, Mr. Evans. This is my friend Ted Worth, and he'll be joining us for the meeting you scheduled today. I informed Bill as we exchanged handshakes. Mr. Thomas Bob. I thought this was supposed to be just between us, Mr. Evans asked. Well, I decided to bring Ted with me. Anything you want to say to me, you can say to him too, I said firmly, not wanting to discuss it further. Mr. Evans agreed to Ted being there and talked only to me, ignoring Ted. This made Ted smile. I knew what was coming next, but let Mr. Evans speak first before we told him what we planned. Bob, can I call you Bob? Bill asked. Sure, no problem. Actually, I thought it might be good to have Jeff Davis here, too. I'm not sure if it's possible, but it concerns him, too, I told Mr. Evans. After a short pause, he pressed a button on his intercom. Julie, tell Jeff I need him in my office right away. He should come here as soon as possible, no matter what he's doing. Got it? Jeff will be here soon. In the meantime, I want to express my sincere apologies for the trouble caused by Jeff and Sue in your life. I know last night must have been awful, but if we collaborate, we might be able to find a solution beneficial to all parties. Bill expressed optimistically, What exactly do you mean, Mr. Farr Evans? I inquired, waiting for Jeff's arrival. I genuinely care for your wife, Sue. Bill began, but was interrupted by Jeff's entrance. He hesitated momentarily, appearing as though he might turn and leave. But Bill instructed him to take a seat. Reluctantly, Jeff complied, avoiding eye contact with me. Bob, I wanted to convey that I have great affection for Sue. Almost like a daughter, he started to speak when Ted interjected. Are you implying you have a penchant for incest, Mr. Evans? Ted asked, catching him off guard. I chuckled to myself, understanding the intent behind Ted's remark. What? What are you suggesting? 
Do I have a fondness for incest? What on earth does that mean? He replied angrily. Let me show you something, Ted said, putting the DVD player on Bill's desk. They say a picture is worth a thousand words. He gave the pictures to Jeff, not Bill. Jeff looked shocked and passed them to Bill slowly. The pictures showed Bill and Jeff with my wife, clearly showing who they were and what they were doing. I even thought Bill recognized his own table where he and Sue were together. Jeff, did you really record this on video and give copies? Bill asked, almost speechless. Jeff couldn't respond, looking completely shocked. Mr. Evans, here's what's going to happen, Ted said, enjoying the moment. And just to be clear, I'm Bobby's lawyer and friend. Here's what we expect and how we want you to deal with it. First, Sue keeps her job, no question about it. Bobby thinks she should still work here, and she seems to get along well with everyone, he said, looking at Bill and giving a little wink. Second, Mr. Davis is no longer part of this. Sue stays, and he exits, Tad declared to Bill, gesturing towards the flabbergasted Jeff. Thirdly, we expect you to present us with a monetary offer that respects our intelligence. We'll entertain your initial proposal and provide a yes or no response within five business days. We anticipate taking legal action within two months, possibly sooner if necessary. Before they could interject, Tad initiated the video playback, swiveling the screen for Bill's viewing. It depicted both men engaging in carnal acts with my wife repetitively in their boardroom. Jeff didn't need to watch, given his involvement in the video recording. Bill simply observed with his mouth agape. I could sense his mind working overtime, contemplating how to salvage his business, reputation, family life, and most importantly, finances. I knew action would be imminent. Jeff, after these gentlemen depart today, we'll need to have a serious discussion about your future employment here. I'll consult with my legal counsel to negotiate a settlement that satisfies you to some extent. You both comprehend the potential repercussions for our business if this information were to surface prematurely, Bill mused aloud. Don't fret, Mr. Evans. We'll maintain your confidentiality until we receive a serious proposal from you. I wouldn't rush to terminate Mr. Davis's employment just yet. He may possess additional copies of the video providing him with leverage. If we don't do anything, you and Mr. Davis can handle this on your own, Tad warned. And just so you know, both of you could get in legal trouble for being involved with an employee. That could affect your jobs and future opportunities. As we got up to leave, Tad took back the DVD player and the pictures we brought. We left just as Bill and Jeff looked like they were going to talk alone. I had a question for Tad, but he motioned for me to be quiet until we were outside. I didn't see my wife trying to listen to us from around the corner, but Tad did. The last thing I heard was Mr. Evans telling Julie to get Sue Thomas there right away. I smiled looking forward to what would happen next. Bill would soon find out that I found his DVD in our house. Once we were outside, we talked. I asked why he had let Jeff have a way out by suggesting he use his own video against Bill. Divide and conquer, Ted explained. It's better if they don't work together, but instead each looks out for themselves. That way, if Bill makes a weak offer to us, we can make them fight each other. Ted also pointed out that Jeff and Bill have families and go to church, even though they acted badly in the videos. They don't want to cause trouble in their families right now. As I left the building, I realized it would be remembered as the place where my wife betrayed me, instead of the nice workplace she used to be part of. It saddened me to think about. Ted's words snapped me back to reality. All right, let's grab a beer before our next rendezvous at the tennis club at 4 p.m. We could both use a drink right now, and there's something I need to discuss with you. Though I'm not quite sure how yet, Ted mentioned as we drove across town toward the tennis club. We stopped at a quaint bar restaurant adjacent to the tennis club. Ted ordered two beers and began speaking to me. Bobby, I believe Bill Evans will extend an offer, but likely for just under a million. I'm familiar with his legal team from another case, and they're quite adept. He's also a realist. I'll call him tomorrow and convey that a lowball offer won't bode well for his client's business or personal life. I'll propose around three million or suggest we abandon negotiations altogether, he disclosed. Furthermore, I need to ascertain if, in the event the offer is rejected, I have your authorization to cast Susan in an unfavorable light. I won't hold back for anything. My duty as your legal representative is to pursue what ensures victory in court, even if it entails painting an unflattering portrait of her. It might get ugly and highly publicized. I'll utilize every legal means at my disposal to secure our case. You might not appreciate all the potentially damning revelations about Sue, your marriage, and even your carnal life that could surface. I'm not sure if you've considered this aspect. 
Ted added at the eleventh hour, I expressed that I had given serious consideration to the matter and believed I possessed more integrity than they gave me credit for. I told Ted that if needed, I was ready to take action, but I'd preferred to try sorting things out with a financial offer first. Ted agreed and suggested we start by seeing what Bill could offer. He promised that if Bill's offer wasn't good enough, he'd handle all the paperwork quickly. He also said he could use his connections in newspapers and local news stations to get footage or pictures, even if they had to blur out the explicit parts like they do on TV shows. Ted, you've always been there for me, and I trust your judgment, I said. I just wish this mess never happened. It's better to be clueless about a cheating wife than to be embarrassed in public. But you have my permission to do whatever needs to be done. After all, I didn't start this mess, but I want it to end soon, I added, feeling frustrated. Understood, Bobby. No problem. Now, let's discuss the material for our next meeting. This guy, Mr. Harry Rydell, is the owner of the Ace Tennis Club. This is the guy I pointed out in the video in my office. He's indicated that he'll likely adopt a laissez-faire attitude, asserting that adults will be adults and he won't intervene. Even Tony's tennis coach might be dismissed for appearance's sake, only to be rehired later. Tony's quite popular at the club, particularly among female members. Keep in mind, Bobby, that while men primarily pay club dues, women are also stakeholders. This dynamic will be pivotal in your interaction with Mr. Rydell. He briefed me on the situation. We arrived just in time, and it was evident that Mr. Rydell and Thad didn't see eye to eye. Their animosity was palpable from the outset, Mr. Rydell told Thad bluntly, signaling the meeting's conclusion. Mr. Rydell, this is Bob Thomas, he said, nodding in my direction, and his wife is a member of your club. It has come to our attention that Tony Simba, your tennis instructor, was having an affair with Mr. Thomas's wife. We want to know what you plan to do about this, Tad finished. He waited for Rydell to speak, but even I knew that he would take everything upon himself and in a few words send Thad to hell. Listen, what two consenting adults do behind closed doors in their own time is none of my business. Harry Rydell informed us. And as for you, Mr. Thomas, if you can't satisfy your wife in the bedroom, don't come crying to me and blaming me if she strays. There are plenty of unhappy spouses who frequent the Ace Tennis Club. Some keep returning for the personalized attention my staff provides them if you catch my drift, Harry said, winking at me. I wanted to yell at him, but Ted stopped me and quietly told me to stay calm and let him handle it. You're assuming this happened without the club owner knowing or agreeing to it, Ted said firmly to Harry. He took out a DVD player and put it on Harry's desk. Ted pressed play and showed Harry the screen. Harry didn't seem happy about what he saw in the video. Before Harry could say anything, Thad spoke up. Harry, you and your colleague knew what was happening and took advantage of a member of your club, Thad said. Mrs. Susan Thomas, who is married and has her membership paid by Mr. Thomas, is now unhappy, he told the quiet Mr. Rydell. When this information surfaces, every dues-paying man will want to know if his wife is engaging in similar activities while he foots the bill. I'll have to subpoena everyone present in the locker room that day. Married men may not be pleased with you about this, Ted added, adopting an almost storytelling tone. Furthermore, there's the issue of reasonable expectation of privacy when filming in the locker room. Harry, once I'm through with you, your club won't retain its community reputation and your bank account may suffer as well, Ted asserted for added persuasion. So here's what we're after. A substantial offer from you and prompt action. Doing so could spare you considerable inconvenience and financial loss, Ted concluded, as we observed Harry Rydell weighing his options. I can't argue with your reasoning. I'll contact you tomorrow with my offer. If I do what you're asking, you'll give me back all the tapes and keep everything private. I'll also fire Tony willingly. So if that's all you came here for, get out, Harry Rydell told us, as Ted took the DVD player with a grin and turned it off. Oh, and say hi to Tito Martinez, Ted said to Harry before leaving the room. Go to hell, Worth, Harry said angrily. Ted laughed all the way to the parking lot. That was quite an adventure. Now we wait for suggestions, Tad told me as we went to his house for dinner. By the end of the week, Bill Evans offered nearly $1.27 million to keep Sue working for him. Jeff Davis gave all his tapes to Bill Evans and ended up losing his job. Bill just fired him, leaving Jeff with little to do. I went after the two guys who were with my wife the night I caught her with Jeff. They were two of Jeff's big clients. They didn't want any attention, so each of them offered me a million dollars to keep quiet. Harry Rydell refused to give us anything and said we should take legal action. So we did, and he ended up losing three million dollars. A lot of people left his club, and he had to sell it. He likely thought he could evade consequences, 
But the judge wasn't impressed with the footage from the private locker rooms, nor with the infidelity. I granted Sue a house and a car as she desired, without having to pay a cent in child support. I only encountered her twice in court. Both times I greeted her as a strumpet, which brought her to tears. I often pondered why she cried now, but not before causing such turmoil in my life. I came into more money than I ever imagined thanks to following Ted's advice. The pain still lingered, haunting me to this day. All the trials of that dreadful year rushed back in an instant. I hadn't realized anyone was addressing me until I snapped out of my flashback and heard the restaurant manager inquiring if everything was all right. Unsure how long I had stood there lost in thought, I shook my head to clear it and returned to the present. Apologies, just reminiscing about an old issue once I saw the group I came to meet. Thanks again, I explained to the manager, noticing the curious glance he gave, reminiscent of how people regard an elderly person lost in reverie. I made a beeline for my ex-wife's table. The surprise was evident on her face. When last we were together, I was overweight, with long hair and a beard, nursing an old knee injury from baseball. That was my excuse then, but truthfully, I had settled into a complacent life with her. Now I sported a shorter haircut, was trimmed from regular workouts, and had my knee repaired thanks to the money from Jeff and Bill's company. My suits were now upscale, and I made an effort to present well in public. I opted to speak up first. Almost forgot how stunning you could be, I remarked, intentionally provoking a reaction. I knew exactly how to push her buttons. My name is Susan Bobby. Why can't you address me by my name? She retorted, clearly irritated. I didn't label you strumpet. You know who did? I simply find it fitting. I warned you three years ago that you shattered my heart, and I'll always remember you by that title, I explained, as the man beside her began to object and rise from his seat. But Sue urged him to remain calm. Tears welled up, smudging her makeup. Her boyfriend interjected, go freshen up Sue and fix your face. I'll handle this idiot for you. With those words, she stood, locking eyes with me as I reciprocated with a single glance, perhaps revealing the agony I'd harbored for three years. Her tears flowed harder, surprising me that she still harbored any sentiment toward me, or perhaps it was lingering guilt, likely a blend of both. I expect you to be gone when I return, she declared tearfully. Heading to the restroom where I noticed the sizable engagement ring on her finger as she wiped her eyes and left. You must be Bob Thomas, Sue's ex-husband, he queried with disdain in his tone. You must be the new guy she's been talking about, I said, sensing he was upset. I'm Sue's CFO, and if I were you, I wouldn't use that word, he warned, but he didn't want to make a scene. I just wanted to talk to you alone. I have three questions, then I'll leave you alone forever, I said, noticing his confused look. I've been through what you're going through now, and I don't want anyone else to go through what I did. I guess she told you I was a bad husband, abusive, neglectful, or a cheater, I said, knowing exactly what she told him. But I'm not here to change your opinion of me. Honestly, I don't think it would do any good. First question, does Sarah still have her Avon meetings at her house on Tuesdays and Thursdays? I inquired. Sue assists Sarah with her decor sales on Mondays and Wednesdays. It seems your memory's a bit faulty, he snapped back. All right then, does she still take tennis lessons on Saturdays? I pressed. Sue swings a racket on Sundays. You seem to have a hazy recollection for someone married to her for so long, he remarked triumphantly. All right, final question. Have you ever checked under the bottom drawer of the dresser in your living room? I asked hurriedly. No, why would I do that, he asked. The three questions I asked you are why we broke up. I still have all the papers from the divorce in my office. There are legal papers, emails from Sarah and the other woman, and hours of videos. I've had them with me for three years, so I thought you should have them, I said, taking out a worn piece of paper from my wallet. This is what the other woman wrote to Sarah when she asked how to get rid of me before I found out about her cheating, I explained, giving him the paper. After reading that letter, I realized I didn't really know her at all, and maybe I still don't. But it's all connected to you, I said, handing him the paper. I knew Sue very well and understood her habits. She always followed the same routine meticulously, sometimes driving me crazy. I also had a feeling that even with a new man, she'd stick to her old ways, I elaborated. He seemed hesitant to accept the paper, but curiosity seemed to win out. He reached over and opened the email. I've carried it for three years, occasionally rereading it and striving to better myself so that no woman would ever write such things about me again. Of all the evidence, that email hit me the hardest, which is why I've kept it with me. It's the same email I mentioned earlier in my story. Peter read the letter slowly and set it down on the table. Quickly he grabbed a pen, scribbled a note on it, and to my surprise, abruptly left the no glance back, no thanks, nothing, 
His expression remained impassive. I leaned over to see what he had written on the old email. I'll return home shortly. Please wait here and I'll call you in 15 minutes. I need to check under the bottom drawer of my living room dresser. Be right back, Peter. I sensed he'd seen the truth, even if he wasn't thrilled about it. Something told me I hit too close to home on all three matters. The email seemed to be the tipping point, and he needed to verify it himself. Leaving a note on Sue's table, I departed. There was no way I'd stay in that restaurant with anyone tonight. In the hallway, I called my client. They were okay with changing the meeting time since they were already running late. Before I left, I looked at the table one more time. Sue came back looking for Peter. She sat down and saw her old email and Peter's note underneath. Her face went pale when she saw what was written in her old email and Peter's message. The last time I saw my wife, she was crying so hard that everyone in the restaurant noticed. I felt a little sorry for her, but I also didn't really care. That was the last time I saw her. I still wonder if Peter found something under the dresser drawer. Sue's tears made me think he might have. Second story, I am 21 got cheated on by my girlfriend, and she thinks it is funny. My girlfriend of three years betrayed my trust by cheating on me with her ex-boyfriend multiple times. I thought we had a great relationship, but she still cheated despite me always being there for her. I bought her flowers, jewelry, picked her up whenever she needed, and listened to all her problems. Yet, she cheated with her ex, someone I warned her about because it was clear he still liked her. All she ever said was, he's just a great friend, and there would never be anything between us. One night, while she was hanging out with friends I didn't trust, I got text messages and photos of her kissing her ex-boyfriend. I was really upset and wanted to talk to her about it, but a good friend stopped me and helped me calm down. The next day, I talked to her about what happened. She said she thought it was funny and that her ex was there for her more often than I was. I should have ended our relationship then, but I was confused and still cared about her, so I tried to work things out. Unfortunately, she kept cheating on me. After more arguments, promises to change, and failed attempts to fix things, I finally decided to break up with her. Months later, we reconnected. She apologized profusely and expressed regret. We started dating again because of my remaining feelings. After a few months, all the feelings returned, and we considered getting back together. However, she abruptly stopped all communication for three weeks. Finally, her message arrived. The classic, we need to talk. She ended things again, claiming it wasn't my fault and all the stereotypical bullshit, only for me to find out two hours ago she already has a new boyfriend. I'm completely down and lost. Any advice? Thanks for joining us on this chapter of Relation Tales. If you were moved by these stories, hit that subscribe button and ring the notification bell. Don't miss out on the upcoming emotional roller coaster of relationships. Your support means the world, and we can't wait to share more compelling tales with you. Until next time, remember, every relationship has a story worth telling. See you soon.